Welcome to Painting with Word. <laughs> so, uh, my name is Samantha Rager. I graduated from Seton Hill with the MFA program in June 2013. Um, I've gone on to write, uh, work as a writer at a couple different um, game studios. I'm currently working as a content writer for Microsoft. I've write, written and published some poetry, and then I'm also working on novels of my own. One of the things I have always struggled with is description. Um, I fre frequently got things like, that's a good scene, but the writing is a bit sparse. The action and dialogue are fine, but there's no sense of setting. Can't picture the characters. Description is dry and or flat. It needs more description. It needs to convey more emotion. And I'm always like, that's great. I would totally do that and would have already done it if I knew at all how to do that and what that all means. So I really, really struggled until I read this book, Word Painting by Rebecca McClanahan. Um, this is the, it's on the second edition, so this is what the second edition of the book looks like. And there was definitely moments when I was reading it that it was like the clouds parted and I was like, oh my god, this is what they mean when they say, like, write better description. So a couple of her quotes that I really like is, description is not all the flowery stuff. Or, de or if description is the flowering, it is also the root and stem of effective writing. The naked eye provides us with sensory, concrete experiences. The imaginative eye opens up other worlds. So she went on to explain that there's four traditional discourse modes. We get exposition, which supplies the background information. It gives the reader context. There's argumentation, which presents reasons and evidence and persuades the reader to a particular viewpoint or feeling. Narration, which we're all pretty familiar with, which supplies the storyline. It's what moves the plot forward. And then description, paints pictures in the reader's mind with the words of your novel. Description can also act as all the others. So description does everything, or uh, yeah, does everything. So the four levels, uh, four layers of description, you get scientific, the facts. The sky is blue, the grass is green. It is 83 degrees outside. And then you get the sensory, um, the sight, the sound, the smells, the touch, the taste of things. Then you can add in emotional. So what is the character's mental state um, as they're experiencing things? And then you've got poetic. So that's the pretty, that's the lyrical, that's the metaphors that you get to throw in. Um, so it's adding all of that in, but like not getting into purple prose, where it's just like four pages of describing the wind blowing through Edward Cullen's hair. <laughs> so you want to avoid that. Um, get accurate and precise naming is where it really gets important. So I was doing things like this on the table sat a vase of flowers. And then they're like, oh, well, we need more description. I'm like, I described what was there. What do you mean you need more? What they meant was they wanted things like this. So on the dining room table, atop the lace tablecloth, sat Nana's favorite crystal vase, filled with a handful of pristine white peonies. You can see exactly what this is. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm telling it's not just any vase, it's Nana's vase. There's a lace tablecloth. It's not just any flowers, it's perfect white peonies. So very clearly you can see what that is versus the other one, you're like, well, I can uh, come up with my own, but um, as, as the writer, it's our job to tell them specifically what we want you to see. So the scientific details. Uh, so what are the unchangeable facts of the scene? It's not just a table, it's the dining room table with a lace tablecloth. It's not just a vase, it's Nana's favorite vase. It's not just flowers, it's white, pristine white peonies. The description brings forth the attributes of the subjects rather than simply explaining or labeling them. So we're getting into our first writing exercise. Sorry if I'm going fast, but I've got a lot of writing exercises and I've got to condense this all into 50 minutes, so I want you to get the most of it. So you're going to pick an object, you're going to list all the scientific facts of that object, and then write down any memories that kind of bubble up uh, from that object. Uh, use sensory details, so concrete nouns, it's, it's orange, it's hard, it's squishy, um, and avoid, try to avoid your labeling adjectives. So just think of, think of an object, maybe something you've encountered today, something in this room, um, and just write down scientific facts and memories that you're, you can associate with that. So I'm going to give you a few minutes to that. Okay, who would like to volunteer what they came up with? I will volunteer. 
around here. Thank you, CJ. Um, so I have a six inch square micro, uh, microfiber cleaning cloth. Okay. On the front is a picture of the Seton Hill University Administrative Building in the summertime with trees, green grass, and a large building with a Catholic cross on the front. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. So if she put that into a novel or into a story, me as the reader, what I'm going to assume is this cleaning cloth, even though it's just a cleaning cloth, is important because what you've done is you've done deep observation on this object. So I, I'm supposed to know all the things about this. Like I'm supposed to know that this has significance because we've spent time on it. So you would do this sort of deep observation on things that are important. Um, that you want the reader to linger on. If you're, if it's not, if it's a throwaway thing, then yeah, it would be like, oh, well, there was a table over there as we were walking by. Um, but when it's important, maybe that's a cleaning cloth that her great great second aunt gave her on her deathbed, and like that's why it's so important to this character to note all these things. That it would seem silly to anybody else, but because you've spent so much time putting in all that detail. We can really visualize it and we know that it holds emotional weight for the story. So we're going to go into the sensory aspects. So we write with all five sentences, or all five sense, senses, and then if your character has an extra sense, you use that as well. So that's where you get into like fantasy, supernatural, maybe even science fiction. They've somehow got an extra sense. So with sight, it's what do we see, and this is the most overused type of description that we see in novels, because we all we are always writing what we see, um, and we tend to over-rely on that sense. Um, smell is actually the next one that's the most overused. Um, so, you know, we smell smoke, we smell sweat, uh, bad breath, dust, the smell of weed. I'm from Washington, so I mean that weed. Um, it's very easy to throw scent into a your story and it should be included. Um, I think we all, you walk into this building, it has a smell that's different than outside versus if you walk into the gym. Taste. Uh, embrace your inner mouth breather. You know, the air has a taste to it. If you're at the dump, your mouth is closed because you don't want to, to take in the taste of that air. Um, you know, we, we taste blood, we taste sweat. I know if I go on a run and then I take a shower or I'm washing my face, I can taste the sweat on my lips as I'm washing it away. Uh, touch, uh, what do they feel? The ground beneath them is, this ground is hard. This is not a, I, want, I don't wanna do jumping jacks on this floor because I know my knees are gonna feel it, my feet are gonna feel it. Uh, the sweat on your skin, if it's really hot and sweat is rolling down your skin, that is a sensation that you are aware of. What do they hear? Like right now I hear this, the gentle buzz of the, the air going in this room. I hear you guys typing. I hear my own voice. Uh, and then you get into the extra senses. I've seen some really cool things. Um, you know, the spider, spidey sense, the tingling of the brain, if something is going wrong. One of my favorite um, so three book romance series, Paranormal, set in San Francisco 1920s. And in the first book, the gal is a medium, but like an actual medium. And when she's a summoning ghost to talk to them, her breath breathes fog like it's like you would go out in the cold, except it's not cold for anybody else. It's just her. She breathes that, that breath out and it's the, the fog, the cold of the otherworldly thing. And that and so she also does that if she's like walking down the street and suddenly she breathes and she sees her breath and she goes, Oh, shoot, because she knows there's a ghost coming to mess with her. So that's a cool way to use an extra sensory thing. So smell. We're gonna, I'm, I don't have a slide for sight because we use it so much, so I, I did the other ones. Smell lasts longer in memory than other senses. I've definitely had times where I've gone and I've like smelled a bar of soap because they come in all different, like all girls do, we grab all the bars of soap in the store to smell what they smell like. And I've smelled ones where I'm like, this smells like a memory, but I don't know what the memory is but I know I've smelled this before, and it's, I'm reacting at an emotional level to it, even though I maybe don't know why, or maybe you do know why. Um, we tend to invoke smells by describing them in terms of other smells, which is an interesting thing, like, oh, this, this room smells like a dump, because we all know what the dump smells like. Um, this, I don't know, this perfume smells like a rose. 
might not even have roses in it, but we, we describe it in terms of other things so we can relate to it. Um, confine the smell to a particular place weighted in history. Uh, for me, like, I know the smell of going to my grandma's kitchen when she's making tamales. And I distinctly know that smell. So if I'm around somebody else and they're making tamales, I'm right back in my grandma's kitchen. So that's a way to invoke emotion and senses and description within your story is they smell something and they're somewhere else suddenly. They're remembering something else. Uh, mix two or more smells to invoke the qualities of a person, place, or object. So my grandma smells like flour, tortillas, tamales, fried eggs. And those are dear things to me, and it's just food. But. Taste. Everything said about smell applies to taste. Uh, it's interesting. So the, when we smell, it's not just like nothing in the air, and then suddenly it, we hit, it hits our nose. It's this magical thing. Smell is actual little tiny particles, that uh, volatile particles that are like light enough to float in the air, and that's what we're smelling. It's those particles of the thing. So when you're smelling the dump, you're actually, it's all those little nasty particles of the dump floating in the air, and you're taking it in, and it's hitting your nose. So you could, that's why you also taste the dump when you breathe in that smell. You taste the smell. Um, like snakes, they flick, or, they flick their tongue out to smell the air. Uh, so be careful when naming specific foods. Although it's great, like it works for me, fried eggs, tamales, awesome. Um, maybe somebody doesn't, like, readers don't have that association, like, I know what a tamale smells like, but it might be not everybody does. So, I'm trying to invoke something and maybe it's going to fall flat. So you can, it's not saying you can't do it, but like, definitely use your beta readers to see like, am I invoking what I want to invoke? And if they go like, no, I have no idea what you're talking about, then maybe you have to rework that scene. Um, you can still use the stuff, but you have to find a way to convey what you want. Uh, I can never pronounce it, the goose, the taste on your, your tongue, what you actually taste. Um, sweet, salty, sour, bitter, umami. Um, and then remember, bitter can describe, like, these all can be different things. Bitter can be a piece of dark chocolate or it can be something toxic. Sweet, like, I love sweet things, but there's definitely times when I'm like, oh, that's, that's, a, that's a bad sweet, that's like, oh, sickly sweet. Um, I love cotton candy, my father, will vomit. He can't handle. So there's different sides to everything. And our tongues know more flavors than food and drink. We chew on blades of grass, bite the ends of cigars, suck on a cinnamon flavored toothpick. So again, these are interesting ways to bring description in. Like I know this, I don't know what the flowers are called, but they're weeds. And you see them and they're those long stalks. And I've got this little yellow flower at the top and I would walk home from school and I'd pick those flowers and you'd suck the the stock because it tasted sweet and like that was all the kids in my area of the world we grew up doing that honey suckle, honey suckle. Mm -hmm. um flocks yeah we used to suck flocks yeah um i was a weird child so i did eat sand so i know the taste of sand i know how it crunches in my mouth because I, like i said i was weird um but like everybody like i have a friend who just recently dumped out an entire container of a specific brand of almond milk because she said it tastes like play-doh she couldn't drink it. So we all know the taste of other things that we can then use to describe. So I, I know what that milk brand that she threw out tastes like, and I knew I didn't like it. But until she said, oh, it tastes like Play-Doh, I was like, oh, yeah, you're kind of right. Like, I know what the smell of Play-Doh is. And she, like, the taste, I'm like, I'm assuming those would go hand. Yeah, you're right, it's Play-Doh. Can't drink it either. Touch is an intimate sense. It bridges physical and emotional distances. When physical terms no longer suffice to describe her sensations, the narrator breaks into metaphor and simile. Her hair felt like velvet. Um, you know, the, the touch of, the, the warmth of the sun touching my skin reminded me of his hug. We, we can get into things like that. Sound. Name specific. There's different ways we can work with sounds. So you can name specific sounds. The hair blow dryer, the chainsaw, the front door slamming. We can suggest sounds by modifying it through the use of adjectives. The sharp tapping of her heels echoed down the hall. I think we've all heard women with those stiletto high heels walking on hard floor. You hear them coming. And then uh, onomatopoeia, which is just fun to say. 
bloop, splash, spray, sprinkle, squirt, drip, drizzle. It's those when if you read comic books, it would be like in the pow, bam things of like the fight. And so that's onomatopoeia can get fun, but um, you don't want to overuse it because it can call attention to itself because it is specifically your, this is what the sound is supposed to, this is the sound um, versus, you know, the sharp tapping of heels. Like now we're given other things. I love this. Um, the six senses. So we already talked about the spider senses, the unique traits of like foggy breath that she can see and nobody else can see, or she does and nobody else does. And then, um, not everybody is aware, but there's a thing called synesthesia, and it's when a person's, the wiring in a person's brain is, they've got, the wires have got crossed, so the senses get mixed. So, most typically with people with synesthesia, like when they look at a letter or a number, they see it in a color. So like two is blue, and the letter C is orange or maybe it's sounds. So I've been told by um, two different people who are synesthetic that the one said, my voice sounds like pink. And another one says, my voice um, tastes like strawberry syrup. So it's very interesting to the way you can mix senses together. Um, so I've actually described a character within one of my stories as his voice was warm, like, or was like warm apple cider. Um, to describe like when she hears him speak, like that's the feeling, like if I just took a sip of warm apple cider, that feeling, that sensation rushes over her when she hears him speak. Um, so smells that bring forth color, numbers and words associated with color. We're gonna hop into exercise number two. So we're gonna use two to three sentences, um, using any or all of the senses to create a description of an object or setting, but you are not allowed to use sight. So you have to use your other senses to describe the object or setting. So I'm going to give you five minutes. And then who is going to volunteer? Go for it. Larissa approached the gate, following the chill she felt in her horns as she drew close. The gravitational effect had a gentle hold on her, drawing her in as she reached the threshold. Her equilibrium lurched as she fell through and passed back into our world. That's awesome. And we're not, you get the weight, like her, we feel, start feeling emotion because you're describing like, the, she's feeling the tug of this thing and it's, we, I mean, we know it's a gate, we know it's a normal point, but you don't have to throw in all that extra like, oh, it's swirling black and whatever. I liked it, I really liked it. And, and it's, a, it's an event that you actually cannot see now without special equipment. Yeah, so that was really good, I liked that one. Um, so if you run into areas where you feel like, oh, my description is lacking, um, even my, my emotional uh, weight is lacking, take a look, see like, okay, I'm, I'm relying, you'll probably find you're relying heavily on sight. See how you can pull in the other senses to add to the description um, to give it more weight. So speaking of emotional, um, so this is how we show the character's mental state in that specific moment. We feel emotions physically because emotions cause a physical reaction in the body. Um, when we're happy, we, we feel energetic, we feel lighter. When we're angry, like that's where you can start getting that tunnel vision because your body is getting ready for a fight or, or flight. Um, you, your body starts pumping adrenaline. You start, you, your body is getting ready, like muscles are tensing, you're gonna do this. Um, when you're sad, like I can read a story and get to that part where it's like the black moment in a romance novel and I feel it in my chest, I feel it tighten and it's a pang, like somebody took it very, like a hat pin, <laughs> coming from CJ's mom, they took a hat pin and it's gone right through my sternum. I feel that pain as a physical pain, I just know it's not going to kill me. I know it's my emotions causing it, but it is a physical thing I feel. Um, and if you're not sure how emotions look, um, there's books on body language. Go pick up body language. If you're defensive, if you're not feeling the situation, we create a shield. We create a physical shield with our arms to say, stay back. I'm, I'm not into this. And you can watch people and you'll notice sometimes they stand like this, because maybe because it's comfortable, but sometimes it's because they're not really into what's happening. And then if maybe somebody new comes in, they're like, oh, I like this part of the conversation. The arms drop away and we engage. We're inviting them in. We turn our legs, we turn our bodies towards people we're talking to, towards people we want to engage. Um, we turn we turn away or we you know arm up and like this to 
to present in front of like, uh, I'm not really into this or I'm not feeling safe. Um, so books on body language are great to help with um, how emotion sh physically shows up. I also highly recommend getting a copy of the Emotions of Taurus. Um, I use the ebook version because then it's very easy for me to go, what does embarrassment look like? And it just gives me this example of like how people act when they're embarrassed. You, you would do these kinds of behaviors. Um, and it might sound silly, but like, oh my God, I can't even tell you the number of times that I've gone to it because I don't want to use the standard cliche of like, oh, well, she stomped her foot because she was mad. Like there's other ways to show anger but sometimes you get stuck in the rut of like, I can't, I just can't think of anything. Like we're all writers, we go to a thesaurus to like, well, how else can I say uh, sachet? And it's like, you, go, you pull out your thesaurus for that. So pull out your emotions thesaurus and find other ways of showing emotion so it's not the same thing over and over again. There's one particular author I've been reading lately. I've read all of her books, because that's what I do. Um, and she's really fond of characters knifing up. Like they're lying down or something and they knifed up into a sit and like, and the number of times I've counted that book, like that phrase appearing throughout all of her books and like multiple times within a single book, a knife up. And it becomes very glaring because I'm, oh yeah, so this, she's very fond of them doing this when they feel this way. So branch out. Poetic, we use prose, we make pretty lyrical sentences and we use our metaphor. Um, it does not mean forcing purple prose into it. Like you don't have to spend like I was saying, you don't have to spend four pages describing the way to throw into somebody's hair, unless that's your thing and you really like it, then more power to you, go for it. Um, but read your work slowly. See where you really want, like this is an emotional scene, I want it to convey that. So you're gonna slow down, you're gonna use that deep observation, um, and you're gonna start maybe adding some lyrical lines in there, like get in touch with your inner poet. Um, and that will help you convey the depth of the emotion of the scene. So, have another writing exercise, yay! Avoid traditional labels. So you can go either route, there's two options for you for this writing exercise. You can take something that's traditionally beautiful and turn it into something unsettling. So traditional beautiful things, we think of a rose, a geode, a piece of jewelry, a tropical bird. Um, and then the other way you can go is to take something traditionally ugly and make it something very touching. So a bug, <laughs> A horn stained book, a weed, um, burnt food, like eh, those aren't really like nice things. But when you give it the emotional weight of the reverse, so you take a rose which is beautiful, unless it's sitting on your car windshield, you know it's from your stalker. Then that rose isn't pretty at all. Um, and burnt food, which is like oh joy, I do not want to eat this burnt toast. But you're the, you're a parent, and your child made it for you, so you're gonna smile and you're probably gonna eat that toast, and you love that your child thought of making you breakfast. So um, I'm gonna give you a few minutes to do this. And then I will be taking volunteers for each of the options. So hopefully we'll get each of the options. And if you're stuck, think of something that you find beautiful, that you find touching, and then think of it like, what's your favorite thing in the world? And make it, how do you make it creepy? And make it unsettling? Or take something that you think is the most beautiful thing or most beautiful place in the world, and how can you, you know, make that unsettling? How can you take your, like, the thing that you hate the most and make that something endearing? And who would like to volunteer for taking something? Yeah, go ahead. He brought her a starfish from the beach. It was the color and fragrance of the sea at low tide, flexible and as thick leather and rough to the touch. She took it back to the sea to finish living. That's nice. I like that. Other volunteer? Go ahead. This is, uh, again, something beautiful made sinister. Uh, the first thing that Rissa noted was the village was dense. The rooted houses would have suffered from ever flooded or packed together so as to restrict the passage to one major avenue. The high roof was simple or simple thatch with no solar panels or lightning rods available. With all the snow and lumber that must have gone into it, could they take days or weeks to build? Were these people not prepared for bad weather? Why were they made to potentially suffer? I like it. 
I mean, it's one of those things where we would think about, oh, what a picturesque scene, how pretty, and you've called a whole nother way of looking at it. Um, does anybody have the something ugly make it touching, make it pretty? Anybody do that option? No? Okay. That's fair. Um, so we're going to talk about character description a little bit. So I, I have dubbed this the All Points Bulletin. He looked in the mirror, as they always do. He was a white male, mid-50s, athletic build, shaved head, brown eyes, dark blue jeans, a gray button-down shirt, and scuffed leather boots. I see this a lot in books, and it's always they look in a mirror. Um, it's the All Points Bulletin. I'm like, this is clearly going out to the police. He's a suspect. Well, he's a fugitive. We need to be concerned. Um, so find ways to try and weave all that description in, but like naturally when it comes into play. So Albert cursed as he scratched at the sunburn on the back of his shaved head. He ran six miles yesterday, but forgot to put on sunblock, and his Irish ancestry was reminding him of his error. The barista behind the counter called his drink. He added sugar and milk in a hurry and splashed coffee onto his clothes. His dark blue jeans hid the stains, but his gray button-down shirt wasn't so lucky. Scuff boots and a stained shirt. Well, that was one way to make an impression at a job interview. So all the same information, but like, I feel like this makes more sense. I feel like this is more natural. It's not us looking to, like, I don't generally look in the mirror and go, yep, I look white, but I'm actually biracial and got dark brown, long curly hair. And like, I don't categorize myself like that. So um, your character is not going to either. Things are going to get called into play as they mean something. So um, exercise four, real quick. So we're gonna so we'll save on time. You don't have to pick a partner, just pick somebody in the room. You don't even have to say who. But do a quick all points bulletin for their description. It could be me, it could be somebody else in the room, or it could be somebody you saw earlier today. Um, but we want an all points bulletin. And then, you're, then the next step um, will be to take that all points bulletin and create a character in a scene like I just did. Um, normally I would want this to be like a much longer exercise, but we gotta go quick because only 15 minutes 50 minutes for this workshop so um so write the all points i'll give you two minutes for that and then i'll or a minute for that and then i'll give you a few minutes to write an actual character description and who would like to volunteer uh first i want to hear what your all points bulletin was and then i want to hear your description you came up with for the character. Any volunteers? It was a very hard exercise. It's a challenging one. I mean, this is one where you, I mean, you could very easily spend a half hour writing out a character description this way. Um, go ahead, Mike. I kind of cheated and used the Vegas one with progress because that's how we focus on That's fine. Time. That works. I'm um, fine with that. So Larissa is six feet tall, dark copper skin, horns that sweep the side of her head, and her hair is cut short by her own hand as she was called to, uh, to duty. Um, and very mean physique as you saw the soldier mm -hmm. in that description. Larissa took off her helmet, mindful of her horns, they ached in the presence of all this magic. She ran a hand through her hair, regretting the haphazard cut she made when she was called to muster. Disengaging her armor piece by piece, she noted the bruises of combat standing out in the dark copper tone of her skin. She dug her hooves into the carpet once the boots were off inside. Uh, that's good. That's a more natural way than, like, she went down to the river and saw herself in the reflection of the water. Mm -hmm. So, because I've also seen that. That's the other thing. I like that. Um, it's things came into play as she would notice them naturally. So as us, the reader, would notice them, her horns, and then oh, she's no, she's taking note of like okay, yeah, that's a big bruise, <laughs> and of course, like she's noticing well, oh yeah, it, it, this is how it's showing in comparison to my skin. Like my when I bruise because I'm so pale, like it shows up like I've been beaten quite severely, and I'm like oh no, I just bumped into something gently. Um, so yeah, you find ways to work them in naturally. So we're moving to real quick setting. Um, it's not the amount of time you spend in a place that matters, it's the intensity of that time. 
I think anybody who went through the MFA program knows we're here when we would come for residency, it's you know five days for residency, and yet we leave after those five days going like I've known you forever. I don't know understand how I'm gonna get through you know the next six months not having you as a daily part of my life. Coming here for Seton Hill, you know, it's just being in the presence of Seton Hill. I told my mom, heaven forbid something happened to me, I, I want to be cremated and I want you to find a way to scatter my ashes at Seton Hill. And out of all the places I've, I've stayed in my life, you know, I've spent less than a full year on campus here, and yet this would be where I would want my ashes to be. Um, in science fiction and fantasy, the imaginary environment the author creates is often the most important element, even more important than plot or character. Um, because you're building this world, it is a character. Um, we all know what this current modern world looks like. If I'm writing a contemporary romance novel set in Seattle, I mean, maybe you don't, you've never been to Seattle, but you know what a big city is like, so you can sort of fill in the blanks. But if I say I'm setting my novel on the planet of, I'm pulling from an actual book that I love, Zemonia, The Land of Zemonias, by Walter Moores. He sets his book in Zemonia. It's a crazy place. Um, none of you know what Zemonia looks like. You have to go read those books to figure it out. Um, and that world is so important. Like, his books can't take place in our world. They wouldn't work, it wouldn't make sense. So, fantasy novels, yeah, it's very, very important to have that description of the, the place, the time, the setting. You also have to kind of organize your descriptions. So you want to carry the reader's gaze around the setting, like they are looking at a painting. Each detail should naturally lead to the next. Jumping from one side of the room to the other, back, leaves the reader feeling disoriented. Um, and descriptions of setting can reflect the character's emotional state. So you can bounce back and forth across the room, but that is a reflection on the character's emotional state. Like maybe they're sen like they've hit sensory overload, and so they're just like, I don't know what's going on. And it feels chaotic because they are feeling chaotic. But if you're walking into like a ballroom, you're you know it's posh and whatnot. Your eyes are like over here and then gently over here. Like you're you're taking in everything as it comes. Maybe making a full circle around the room. Um, so, an example of moving some stuff around. So this is an okay description. Brenna stood next to the cliffside while torrents of rain washed over her. Lightning flashed overhead, followed a few seconds later by the rumble of thunder. Auburn locks of hair adhered to her face and she brushed them back. There's nothing wrong with it, it's fine, but we can do better. Revised, fifth description. Brenna Sinclair stood at the cliffside while torrents of cool rain washed over her. Auburn locks of hair adhered to her face and she brushed them back. Lightning flashed overhead, illuminating the night's dark gray storm clouds. The loud rumble of thunder followed a few seconds later like the warning shout of an angry god, but she didn't flee. She gazed out into the night and stared at the black water of the lake below, studied the trees around her, searching, waiting. So we're sort of flowing from one bit of description into the next, more naturally um, diving deeper into the description than the previous sample. Um, so that's what you want to do. You can, this is a perfectly great first draft. This is, I mean, that's awesome. As far as first drafts go, like, I don't really think I'm that good. Um, so it's perfectly fine. I think I probably had to revise multiple times to get to that level. This is more like a final polish, this is a final polish draft. I've gone in and I've said, this scene needs to have the emotional weight. I need to be here, we need to wait a while, we need to stew, uh, he's like a slow cooker. Uh, so you're gonna stay in there and you're gonna linger on each thing as it's happening a little bit more. Give it weight, find a way. It's not just lightning and thunder, like that thunder is an angry ass god. I said ass in the presence of the Catholic ghost, I'm sorry. Um, so yeah, so dive deeper into those scenes where you want to feel that way. Because I did originally want this to be an emotional scene. Eh, not really. Yeah. Um, since we're right out of time, I'm going to run through the, the last couple slides real quick, so we're not going to do this exercise. But this is an exercise you can do on your own. So if you're writing scenes, try switching them up. Put your character in a setting, write some sentences describing that scene, and then change the time of day, change the mood of the character and then write that scene again and see what new details are going to come out. Um, you could write this as a scene and I'm really happy and preppy, but what if I was like sleep deprived and like super like angry because I just got bad news? Like how would this scene play out? It's all the same stuff. Or what if instead of doing it in this room with like nice air conditioning, like what if like the lights are bad and the air conditioning is out? How is that going to change things? Because I still got to do the exact same stuff. 
So that's a fun exercise. And then when you get stuck, here's a good checklist to use. List your scientific facts. Uh, the unchangeable facts not subject to opinion. It's day, it's raining, the character is standing outside and shivering. Shivering is a fact, like I, you shiver, that's not an option. Like, you can't be like, oh no, she's not shivering, she's shaking, she just fell down. Um, list the sensory details, sight, sound, smell, touch, taste. Add emotion indicators. Show what the character's mental state is. Then you add in your poetic details. Make it sound pretty and lyrical and add metaphors when appropriate. Battle scenes, maybe, maybe not. Figure it out. Thank you for coming. You can find me on Twitter. Um, I am recording this, so I'm going to do some editing to the video and then I'll pop it up on my, my website. So you can always come back to it and view it then. But we are at time. Thank you for coming. I hope I helped you.